what has life taught you recently? I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned, particularly over the last year, is that I'm probably more resilient than what I realised. Um, I think for me, particularly the injury that I had that, that ruled me out of the Olympics and then even heading into this AFLW season, there's been a few hiccups along the way with COVID and I hurt my shoulder early in, in round one. So I think I've learned that I've actually developed a lot more resilience than what I realised. I kind of, a lot of the time, I've almost been waiting for more emotions to hit me or for things to feel a lot worse. And, and I still have had to process a lot, of, a lot of the grief and a lot of the emotions, but I think it's been pretty cool to realise that I'm actually okay at the end of the day. And sport is really important to me and it, it drives me every day, but even if it's taken away that I've got a lot of other stuff going on that means at the end of the day that I'm actually going to be okay. What was your earliest memory of experiencing gender inequality on the sporting field? I can't picture it from when I was a kid, but there's um, a memory that always sticks out to me from when I was at uni. And I was playing basketball at the time and um, I actually made that decision about wanting to try rugby sevens. And one of the guys who I went to uni with I had played rugby his whole life. He'd, he'd played local footy and, and kind of played representative rugby, but had never cracked it at the top level. His, his goal was to represent Australia, but he just had just missed out. And I so clearly remember him saying to me, oh gosh, I wish I was a girl so that I could represent Australia as easily as you do. And it's always stuck with me because I think particularly in, in that instance where I changed sports and I progressed my way up the ranks, relatively quickly and, and was able to represent Australia. It sounded like this really easy task to a lot of people, I think. Um, but people who knew me and my family and close friends understood how many years and years of work had gone into that. Even though I wasn't playing the same sport, I'd worked on my body as an athlete, but I'd worked so hard mentally to prepare myself for performing and and being selected at that level. So I think that's a really clear one that, that always sticks out in my mind. What has been your philosophy on encouraging people to embrace change? I really like this one because I think change has been a really key part of my career. I've copped a bit of criticism sometimes about it. Um, I think there's an element, I don't know if it's in Australian culture or whether it's a sporting thing that success is all about longevity and persistence and, and sticking at something even if it doesn't go your way. But what I've realised is that change is a really positive thing. I found it to be really liberating and I found it really refreshes my motivation and and my sense of value. Um, I loved when I started playing footy down in Melbourne. Um, I had my first first few games of VFLW and, and I was a bit of a headless chook. I didn't really know what I was doing yet. Um, but there was this quote that I read from Steve Jobs that really resonated with me. Um, and it was the heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of becoming a beginner again. And that really just summed it up for me that it just allows you to go out there and, and be free and be okay to make mistakes. I think there's a level of humility that's required with it in the sense that you have to be okay with not being good at it straight away. But it also allows you to get into this space of being really open to learn from people who are the best at what they do. I think that's one of the coolest lessons I've learned throughout these these periods of change in my sporting career is go and find the people who are the best at what they do and ask them as many questions as you can and, and learn as much as you can from them. What does success look like in regards to gender equality and greater exposure for female athletes? <sighs> 
I don't know how to answer this question in a short format. Um, sometimes I feel frustrated that as female athletes, we still have to work so hard, not, not on the field, not in our sporting endeavors, but so hard off the field to continue this push and this, um, it, it, it's proving every single day. I feel like we have to prove why what we do is valuable simply because of, of being a woman. A lot of the time we're seen as lesser than. Um, so I think there's, there's still so many areas of, of change that need to happen. I think to me, equality on the sporting field means um, the financial elements of it, paying female athletes what they're worth. And, and before that even is paying them a livable salary so that they can be professional athletes who can devote their life to their craft. It's a huge step in the right direction. I think another really important element of that is, is sharing the stories of these athletes. I think we know that there's a huge discrepancy in the, in the media coverage of female athletes. And that then in turn has a massive impact on the visibility and the accessibility of the information for that next generation of young kids. So I think to me, success would be an equal playing field, being rewarded equally, being shown equally on TV and in the media, which then means that every young kid that grows up, doesn't matter if it's a boy or a girl, sees these women competing and sees them as equal and looks at them and says, I can do that too. What is your method when it comes to showing resilience? What is an example of how you've done this? I, yeah, I think um, the one that comes to mind is is missing out on the Tokyo Olympics. Um, a, t a teammate and I came from different directions. We were in a tournament about four weeks out from the Olympics and, and we tackled the same player, but from different directions. And so her head, hit, her head hit my cheekbone and I just lay on the ground and I knew straight away, I could feel my, my cheek starting to swell up and I could just feel it. I just knew something wasn't right. And the first thought that came to my head was, you're not going to get to go to the Olympics. And it felt like an eternity until the physio had come over. And eventually they sat me up. And as soon as they sat me up, I just felt blood start dripping from my nose and I hadn't got hit in the nose. And so I knew that wasn't a good sign either. And as they carried me off the field, I just was I was sobbing, I was so upset. I didn't, I wasn't really, I was in pain, but I didn't really care. And the doctors that were by the field thought that I'd been concussed because they thought I was just emotional because I was concussed. But I just was trying to get my head around the fact that I knew what this meant. And I went in, had x-rays done straight away. And I think there were four fractures in my cheekbone and in my sinuses. And I had to, sit in this hospital room, um, quarantined because we'd come out of a hotspot in Sydney during COVID and just sit with, with my thoughts, um, waiting for, to go in for this surgery. And I didn't really know the surgeon talked about the fact that there might be a chance that I could have the surgery done and get back in four weeks to go and compete at the Olympics. But my coach called and, um, said he was coming to the hospital um, and I knew straight away what that meant. Um, yeah, so I got, I got ruled out medically and I just was lying in this damn hospital bed just trying to process what that meant for the past few years of work, the fact that I was going to miss out. Um, in terms of how I showed that resilience, I, I don't really know what I would say in terms of how I demonstrated it. Um, 
But I think a, a really big part of that process for me is demonstrating vulnerability to people who I who I know and who love me. Um, having days where you just say, I'm not okay. And just knowing that, that you've got people around you who are in your corner to support you through things like that. Um, and I think a really big part of that for me is because of the stuff that I'm doing off field with the Female Athlete Project, with the podcast and, and creating this platform for female athletes, I then went back into, into a COVID lockdown but spent the entire time creating content and coverage around the female athletes that were competing in the Olympics and the Paralympics. So it kind of gave me another sense of purpose in a way and, and probably a bit of a healthy distraction. And I think that that was, that was probably a, a pretty cool way of showing resilience as well, that, you know what, like I've been through something that really sucked and I don't get to go and live out my dream of going to a second Olympics, but I actually have a chance to celebrate some pretty incredible athletes who are representing our country and, and doing really amazing things. Which female figure in your life do you draw inspiration from? Um, I think I'm going to say two for this one, and that's going to be my mum and my grandma. Uh, it's my mum because I think she's just gone through life where, where she's, she's raised us three kids and... Um, she kind of was a, a stay-at-home mum when we were younger while Dad was going to work, but once we'd grown up, she got to this stage in her life where she realised she wanted to kind of change careers and, and find out what she was passionate about. And I think for me that's been a really cool lesson and, and probably something I've taken into my sporting career around finding what it is that you're really passionate about and, and following that. And I think... My grandma is the other one. Um, she was diagnosed with dementia a, a, about a year ago. Um, and that's been really hard seeing her go through that. But I think one of the most beautiful things to come from it is her appreciation for the smallest things in life. Sometimes when you go and pick her up to take her out for a coffee or just take her out for a walk and you'll kind of be walking to the car and she'll just stop you and she'll be like, just look, look how beautiful the clouds are today. Or look at that purple flower over there. How magnificent is it? And you're kind of just like, that's the tiniest thing, but it's really special to spend that time with her and kind of, it's just a really nice reminder to actually just stop and be present and appreciate the really little parts of your day. What is your greatest fear? <sighs> I think in a sporting context, my greatest fear would be that I'd get to the end of my career and not have fulfilled my potential. I think that's probably why when you get injured, it, it often hits you really hard because it feels like it's such a big speed bump in, in getting in the way of where you feel like you could end up, the potential that you feel like you have as an athlete. And so I think because it feels like there's been multiple speed bumps over it over the last couple of years. Mentally, it's been really draining because I think it kind of reinforces that fear of what if there's so many of these that I never actually get to be the very best that I'm meant to be. And I think there's a part of knowing that, that that's just part of sport. I've been watching the Winter Olympics and seeing some of the the hectic crashes and injuries that they have and it, it's probably a good reminder that that's sometimes just part of sport. But sometimes that's 
hard to grapple with that as an athlete you try to control so many parts of your day and of your training and of your performance but sometimes there's things that come in and you just don't have any control and you've just got to be okay with that and you've just got to bounce back and think we'll just start again with what we have and and you've got to have faith that you'll get back to that point and you'll keep building and that eventually you'll become the the complete athlete that you want to be <clears throat> why is being a role model for young kids and teens important i think for me it's so important to be a role model for the next generation because sport is a really powerful tool to change people's attitudes about about women. Sport is such a huge part of Australian culture if you think about families sitting on the couch watching it with the kids or going down to the the local oval with a with a cricket bat or a footy or a soccer ball whatever that looks like it's ingrained in our culture and it's actually a really powerful tool to be able to change people's attitudes and I think the more I've grown as an athlete and gained experience and some of the work that I got to do with our watch which is the organization for the prevention of domestic violence um, through the promotion of gender equality and the training that I that I got when I became an ambassador with our watch was around the power that I have as an athlete to be able to change people's attitudes so I think to have the chance to show the next generation of young kids that that women are powerful and women are talented and they're strong and they compete and they stand up for what they believe in is so powerful and it doesn't just inspire them to play sport i think it actually demonstrates to them that we are equal